citations, sources, abstracts, conclusions. Oh, my head's gonna explode. Howdy, I'm Devin Noel Lee, and this is Family History Phonetics. And as you can tell, we like to have fun when it comes to genealogy. But why did I act that way? Well, it was slightly an over-exaggeration of a viewer question from someone right here on YouTube who had, uh, was a little curious about sources, citation, and just how much is too much. Now, many of you have seen Deco Card in the live stream or on the comic feeds in a lot of our videos. We love questions from our viewers and you don't have to be the most prevalent here on our channel, but Deco Cards took some time to send us an email and wanted to ask this question. I'm curious to know what you think about sourcing and citations. And I am so glad they didn't stop there. They went further and explained what they're talking about. I've watched the Ancestry.com videos by Krista Cowan. Hi, Krista. And in my opinion, I think that there is too much redundancy. Ooh. For instance, all of the documentation that she does, which is fine if you enjoy that and want to do it. However, I feel that when you save a source, such as a census, you don't need to type everything that there is up. Oh. This is not a hit on Krista. Krista is one of the pioneers here on YouTube for genealogy, and we're really grateful for her. But I like that Deco Cards was willing to give me a specific example of what he's talking about in reference to what he's now going to ask. I'd like your opinion on this. Maybe I'm just lazy, but what's the point? Maybe you can share what you do and what you know. Thanks. Well, Deco Cards, we love having you in our community and um, know that many of people are thankful that you asked this question and I'm thankful that you were very specific in what you were talking about so that I can answer the question that benefits you as well as other people here on this channel. Now, you're going to hear this a lot from Andy and myself. How much you do in genealogy depends on why you are doing genealogy. Are you casually interested? Are you trying to prove your ancestors for a lineage society? Are you trying to find new t names because that's part of your religious participation? Or are you a serious researcher or doing work for clients? The answer to that question depends on what I'm going to tell you in this video. So you must always filter answers and advice that people give to you based on either A, where they're coming from, or B, where you want to go. And in the case of Krista Cowan, she wants to inspire you to be a little more than a curious researcher. She follows some standards that we're gonna talk about a little bit later, and that's her filter. She comes to genealogy through that filter, but she also wants to invite you to step up your game a little bit. And I promise to tell you why I'm doing genealogy so you can see where this, on the spectrum you may fall. But before we go any further, we have to define some terms because around the world and even in my own neighborhood, if we don't define our terms, it's very difficult to have a conversation. So let's discuss what a source is. So a source is the place or the person or the paper where you found bits and pieces of information that tells you about a fact. So what kind of fact? Well, the name of an ancestor, the place of birth or death, the date any of these things took place, an occupation, the military service. Whew, I really could be here all day if I tried, but let's not. <laughs> so you need to know that a source is what you use in order to give you the evidence for a fact. And then a citation, ugh. There are so many classes about citations in the genealogy field, but let's keep it simple because I'm all about simplicity. I like the Navy. Keep it simple. Silly, <laughs> stupid, you get it. 
So citations need to be complete enough that if you told me where you found your information, I can go find it quickly. Now, I don't know if you know this, but we live in the internet age. I know, big shocker. And it has become easier to retrace people's steps so you don't always have to go to the minutia details. And in some countries, there are no minutia details. So a complete citation has enough information that if you tell me where you found the information, I can track it down quickly. Fair enough? Now, Deco Card specifically said citations and sources, but then he mentioned when Krista did a bunch of writing stuff up and he mentioned a census record. Well, I'm not exactly sure what the writing stuff up means, so I'm going to make throw out three terms to define to ensure we're all call, talking about the same thing and then we're gonna proceed. So transcriptions. Now transcriptions could be one thing that Krista recommends um, that you do and that is when you make a word for word copy of a document. Now I think she and I would kind of agree that in when it comes to old handwriting, you definitely wanna make a transcription because some of those documents are really hard to read and you don't want to blow out your eyeballs trying to read it again and again. So if you could make a transcription of that original handwriting, it makes your research so much more pleasant in the future. Now an abstract is when you pull out key pieces of information from a document. Let's say you have a World War II draft record and you just want to abstract the name of your ancestor, his birth date, maybe his occupation that was listed, as well as his next of kin or informant. And you abstracted just that. Now other people may abstract even more or less information than you did, but why? This may come to your question as to why do people do this? Because Looking at the document again and again and again and again and again gets really tiresome when you're looking for a quick answer. And so abstracts get you the quick answers. And sometimes the abstract will remind you to look at the actual original image again. But if you're just trying to figure out who was the informant on the World War II death, uh, draft record and you abstracted that information, you don't necessarily have to go into the record. Sometimes we write things up because evidence doesn't always make sense as to why we're taking a source and attaching it to an individual. Let's say a census record. Let's say the individual on the census record was W.J. Townsend. Is that William James? Is it Walter Johannesson? It is you get the idea? WJ can mean a whole lot of things. But if you write up why you think WJ Townsend of Franklin County, Ohio in 1880 is your William James Townsend who was married to Mary Clayball, then other people can know why you made that decision and you can remind yourself later. But it's also very important that if you have any conflicting information, let's say that W.J. Townsend from the 1880 census has a birth in Pennsylvania in one census record, but in 1870 it was Ohio. You've got to resolve that conflict. Is it Pennsylvania or is it Ohio? That's why people will often write up their conclusion, and it actually is very valuable because if you come back to your research a week, a year, five years from now, you can remember why you made that decision and why the two conflicting piece of evidence really is about the ancestor that you decided it was for. Now, some of you may or may not know this. I'm going to keep it brief. You can always hit pause and read this genealogy proof standard, but long and sh the long and the short of it is that the more serious you become in genealogy, the more you begin to follow this genealogy proof standard. And this is where all of the sources, all of the citations, and all of the write-up comes to be. Number one, 
sources, number two, your citations, and number three, all of the writing. So depending on, again, that question, why are you doing genealogy, will determine how much of this genealogy proof standard you apply to yourself. So to answer Deco Card's question, what do I think? I think sources and telling people where you found your sources is a fantastic thing. I can't tell you the numbers of times where I can't remember why I did something or I look at research from 20 years ago and I have no idea why those researchers made their choices. And so sources and citations are very important to ensure accuracy because I want to be related to who I'm actually related to instead of a fictional character because if we're going to choose fictional characters, I'm going to get the characters from Poldark. Again, back to your question about should I write everything up? It depends on why you're doing research. I know I like to leave little rabbit trails or paper trails or breadcrumb trails, whatever trail you want to call them, of why I did the things that I did and the decisions I made because A, I want speed and efficiency, but B, I also want to tell myself and others why I made the decisions that I made. So for my casual users out there who are just climbing their trees and maybe looking for a quick name, could you do me a small favor? When you find a source about your ancestor, could you tell us where that source you're using? Because there are some sources that are complete junk. They're complete frauds. They're totally full of mistakes and they're totally fiction. And we want to help you know when you're using stuff that isn't really accurate. Additionally, you can help some serious research like myself know that there's other records out there we haven't explored yet. So let us know where you're finding the facts that you are. And don't be disappointed if somebody tells you you're wrong. But if you really know, like me, I know the date my mom was buried because I was there. I watched her go in the ground then you can defend that position, but you need to have a source to back it up. And since you are a casual researcher, attach your sources to online trees and call it good. But if you're in a collaborative environment such as Family Search, be very careful about changing names, dates, places, and relationships without having a source to back it up because you can't be making a whole huge mess. So if you're casual, please be more cautious in what you're doing. For you genealogy enthusiasts, gather enough sources and citations and maybe do a lot of that abstracting and extracting to answer the questions you're trying to solve. Who were the parents of John? What was the maiden name of John's wife? You won't always get the answer from one record. You definitely want to make sure that you're writing up the conflicts that you encounter. And for you, you need to add sources about your research to either online trees or databases. Since you're a more enthusiastic genealogist, you might actually explore some database softwares to keep your tree planted, so to speak, offline in case things get a little squirrely online. But for anybody who is a professional, anybody trying to become credentialed, or anybody who would like to be one of the two or research like one of those, then you definitely want to be thorough in your use of the genealogy proof standard. So that's my quick advice to deck of cards. What do I think? I think the genealogy proof standard is a nice ideal to strive for, but I won't, I'll be the first to admit I don't use it all of the time because it depends on who I'm researching. Um, my closer lines, I follow it more than some of my, my casual, I really want to just have some fun today. Um, I'll be a little more relaxed in, in what I do. So what do you think? How much documentation, citation, and write-up do you do? And be sure to tell us the filter you're using. What level of genealogy research are you conducting?
So I hope you had a great time here on Family History Fanatics addressing this question. If you, like deco cards, have any questions for us, then be sure to send them our way. But before you forget all about us, make sure you subscribe and hit that bell. So we hope you don't miss another episode, which is why we're going to bribe you. Um, sometimes YouTube doesn't tell you when we posted a new video or we go live. So we have this free guide for you that when you sign up, you'll get a resource on 10 online genealogy sites that you have to try. And by doing so, you'll be subscribed to our newsletter that'll tell you when we have a new YouTube video posted, as well as remind you of when we go live in our, our live streams.